action. Uh, my name is uh, Charlie Radigan. I'm the executive director here at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, and I'd like to thank you all for coming uh, to this very special event. And I want to introduce a new smart board, <laughs> which we haven't been quite trained on yet, but it projects beautifully, and when we get to understand the code and how it operates, we'll be able to do all this fancy stuff. It will be like watching the weather. So you'll be moving things around. So it's, uh, as a result of a grant that we put into an organization called the Butler Foundation, which is located in, uh, in New Hampshire. Um, I'm so delighted to have you come from uh, public access television. Thank you so much for coming as well. My job is simply to introduce Chris Collier, who's going to set the stage for what's going on and explain a little bit about the collaboration between us, the Alaska Wilderness League, and the Sierra Club. Chris Collier, Director of On-Site Interpretation. <laughs> um, so welcome all. Uh, this is a very nice turnout. I'm glad you guys braved the cold, although it's not as bad as it has been. Um, I think it was about a year ago that John and Carol uh, got a hold of us and wanted to talk about a collaboration. Um, so it was sometime last February. Was a, a, oh, maybe, yeah. Or even before, maybe. No, I, it was February. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, either way, uh, it's always nice when... You know, you start something long ago and it actually comes to fruition. Um, so you're helping this come to fruition. Earlier today, we had Robert Thorpe, the photographer. We had David uh, Solomon here and John Demos as well. Uh, so for the visitors that came to our Nature Center for Alaska Day, um, they got to interact with these three fine gentlemen. And that was lovely for our visitors. And then tonight, uh, we get to hear uh, Charlie Berger present about some amazing animals, a little different from the animals we usually teach about here, um, but we like all animals, so. Uh, so with that said, I'll um, let John take over, and thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Charlie, for coming and speaking to us. It was, it was about a year ago, again, we came in, and Carolyn and I met with Chris, and, and Chris said, I said, we said, we're gonna do something with Monshire and do something with, with Vermont Institute of Natural Science, and, and uh, Chris says, why don't you make it a week-long event? So it's another fine mess you've got me in. <laughs> and so we've been uh, doing talks with David at, um, at Montshire, here tonight at Vins, uh, at Dartmouth, uh, at the Episcopal Church, at Kendall. Kendall, all kinds of places. And I just want to, I'm with the Alaska Wilderness League. My name is John Demos. I cover the Northeast for our organization. <coughs> We're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, and offices in Alaska, and then have people like myself stationed around the country, and I cover the Northeast for the group. <coughs> and one of our, we work to protect the key wild lands, public lands, that belong to all Americans in Alaska, like the Tongass National Forest, uh, the Western Arctic, uh, the Arctic Ocean, uh, BLM lands, all kinds of things. But one of the key issues is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the coastal plan of the refuge. And we've been fighting this fight for 30 years. I've been working for 25 years about in the environmental field in the Arctic. Refuge has always been an issue. But uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting David's people. They are Guichen. They live in northern Alaska, outside the refuge. They're Athabascan people. They're actually very close to the, their language is close to the Navajos. We had dinner with the students last night. So lost, and one of the couple of Navajo students, they said, uh, the, in their creation story, the Gwich'in and the and the Navajo were connected, and then got separated, and they should never see each other again, which was sort of alarming. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but what I wanted to do was introduce uh, David's going to speak briefly for about uh, and sing you a song, and then uh, Carol Weingeist, who's really responsible for getting things together this week is going to introduce Charlie. And she put, and I want to thank, I want to thank Vermont Institute of Natural Science and I want to thank um, the Upper Valley Sierra Club so much. But here's David Solomon.
Sir Boji, David Salmon, Kuchaja Kuchin, Kunsi Tochena. I said, my name was David Salmon, I'm from Fort Yukon, Alaska. And I said, everything is good here. <laughs> you know, in our, in our Indian way, we speak our language to identify who we are and just give you a taste of how our, our language uh, sounds. And I want to just share a song. And at the end, I'll sing it in English. Because if I sing it in English, then you guys know what I'm saying. <laughs> if I sing it in Kuchin, you won't know what I'm saying. But, I, but you know, after I sing it in English, you'll, you'll know what song I'm singing. Praise the night, praise the night, praise the because as we hunt up there in our area up there we, we use every single part of the caribou everything and I want to share a story when I first started hunting up here in our in our land up here up there in the Arctic National Wild Refuge I have a grandmother and we have uh, Kuchin people uh, 10,000 to 13,000 people that live there in Canada as well as US I have my grandmother, I lived in Canada, I lived to be 101 years old and still had black hair. <laughs> and I had my grandmother in Port Yukon, I lived to be 103 years old. The reason why, because we live off the land, we, we hunt, we fish, and we trap off the land that we keep everything purified and sacred because that's where the calving ground of the caribou starts right there, the coastal plain, right up in here. And not only that, the birds migrate, they started their, their young ones up there as well. I remember one story I'm gonna share with you with my grandpa when I first went to Arctic Village as a young boy to hunt. We, we go up there to the mountains and we let the first group go by. They call them scouts, some people call them um, leaders. We let them go by because they're breaking the trail. If you, if you get rid of them first, there's no trail for the second herd. So we let them go by and the second herd the second group comes, and when the second group comes, we say, okay, now it's time to go up there. And me and my grandpa will go up there. He would show me where to go. And at one time, I went up there, and I, and I had my 30-30 waiting for them, and I could hear them come around the corner, <laughs> making that noise, and I knew they were coming. Then suddenly, there was thousands of them all the way around me, and I'm standing right there just, <laughs> my grandpa's over there, Shoot, shoot, watch one, watch one. There was thousands of them. And, you know, most people, if they just start slaughtering them, it's no good because if you hit the caribou or you, some of you guys are hunters, if you hit in the wrong spot, it'll be bloodshot. It'll, you'll ruin the meat. So you just can't do that. So I told my grandpa, well, which one am I going to shoot? He said, look at the big horns and look at the side where the, the fat roll. That's one you, you pick. So now I could, okay, now I know which one. And that's how we do. We get enough, just enough for to feed our family, as well as we get enough to feed the elders that can't go out anymore. But the main topic I want, I want to ask you guys, and, and 
is that the cabin ground, the sacred place up here at the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, up here the coastal plain, they call it 1002. It's where the oil company wants to go up there and drill. And we're asking your support to talk to your Congress, talk to your senators, your representative, and tell them that Alaska Kuchin that came all the way down from Alaska to come down there. It took me 29 hours to get here and only slept three hours. But it, it's a sacrifice that I had to take because I know this is a very important issue because people don't realize if they decide to open it up, it'll take them 10 years for production. 10 years to, for the production of oil. But you know how much you're going to save? One cent. That's it. They sure don't tell you that the Alaska the senators, they won't say none of those stuff. They'll say everything that, oh, we need to open it up. But if they open it up, it's going to affect our land up there. And, and I'm, the, I'm, I'm 58 years old. I'm an elder in training. <laughs> so I could train as my grandkids. I got five of them, another one on the way. I want to see their opportunity to live up there. And I want to be like my grandmothers and live up to 100 years old. I want to be proud to walk and say I'm 100 years old because we protected this area for the oil company to, to develop. We don't need that there because it's not going to happen. Do you guys know about Prudhoe Bay? You see how terrible it is already. And they said it was supposed to be a good, good thing. It's not. So we're asking you guys for your support. We're asking you guys to talk to your Congress, your senators, and say, yeah, the Alaska Kuchin guy that came down here, David Solomon, said that, yeah, this is our backyard. This is our land here. This is what we, uh, we hunt and fish. It's like going to somebody, going through their backyard and saying, here, here's a nickel. I'm going to dig up your backyard and put a bunch of holes in there. And when I leave, I'm going to flip you a dime and walk away without saying thank you. And could your kids play back there? Could your grandkids play back there? No. And that's the same thing with us up here. So we're just asking for your support and talk to your Congress and senators and representatives and say, no, we want to support the Kuchin people up there so they could protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, I, and I want to say, the Masi Cho. Masi Cho. Sunlight Night. Sunlight Night. Said, you see, you, you speak Kuchin now. <laughs> so you're part of us. We adopt you. <laughs> we just thank you very much, my friends. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Masi. living in the Upper Valley for these you know, long numbers of years that I've been here, um, I, I realized when I got involved with the Alaska Wilderness League, this is an amazing core of places for information about the Arctic, Dartmouth Environmental Studies, Krell, Monshire, Vins, and uh, with uh, even two Episcopal Church visits because the Episcopal Church is very important to the Gwich'in people. So we've had eight days of activities, and this Sunday, David is going to be at the um, Episcopal Church in Woodstock, their morning service, and talking afterwards. Anyway, oh, five, six years ago, I saw the movie Oil on Ice, and it changed my life and made me become passionate about wanting to preserve the Arctic coastal plain for over 100,000 calving caribou every summer, millions of birds that migrate there, and it's important that we preserve the life there and the life of the people there. And um, because Charlie was the vet for my last dog, <laughs> and I've taken three of, yeah, a Rottweiler, Mala, <laughs> um, and I've taken three of his courses with the Iliad Osher program, I just felt that adding his dimension to this Alaska Wilderness Week would just be a gift for all of us. So. Here's Charlie Berger. And one, one more thing. It's very important you all sign this because it's important that our parent organizations see how many people come and it gives them uh, a sense of our activities and, and promoting what they're trying to do to promote environmental things. So we'll pass this around. Please, everybody sign it. It's important to get all your names. Thank you, Carol. Um, 
I'm delighted you came. I'm actually delighted to be here, but realize at my age, I'm delighted to be almost anywhere. <laughs> what can I tell you? I would just like to echo a few things that John has said, and David, and Carol. You know, I've, and Erin and I have been fortunate enough to be able to travel a lot to the Arctic and to Anwar, near there and in Anwar, and also to Africa. And what people don't realize, I think, is that true wilderness, other than Antarctica, virtually does not exist on this planet. It's not in Africa. We just drove two years ago 5,300 miles through five African countries on dirt roads, and there's no true wilderness there. Every 10 or 15 miles in Africa, there's a village. There's something there. But when you go up to the Arctic, I mean, and get on an Arctic river, sometimes you're hundreds of miles away from any village, scores of miles away from any individual people. And I think um, it's nice to know that there's some place on this planet that still has true wilderness. A few things for those of you who are interested, the Yukon quest is over. Um, at least the winners, uh, Brent Sass won it by an hour and 16 minutes, I think, over Alan Moore. And the reason the race was so close, supposedly Brent took a cat nap and ended up sleeping for nine hours, and it really closed up the race quite a bit. The other thing I'd like to mention before I get into this is, a friend of mine, Joe May, helped put together, and I just got this the other day, this amazing book on the history of the Iditarod. I mean, this is one hell of a book, and uh, for those of you who might be interested in it, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about, without a doubt, the world's greatest endurance athletes. There's not another animal on this planet that could do what these dogs do. These dogs, to put it concisely, are able to run four to five marathons a day for nine or ten straight days in 40 below zero. There's not another mammal with the possible exception of a well-conditioned wild wolf that could begin to do this. Now if I can figure this out. Ah, a little bit about the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest. I've been involved in it since 1990. This year, I'm not doing it. I've done enough of it. But to give you a picture of what we look like, we look like Michelin men. The day after this, I was in the coldest wind chill factor in a, ta in a little village called Unalakleet on the Bering Sea that I ever experienced. It was 114 below zero, the wind chill factor. And this is basically the way you, you dress. You're not comfortable. Um, <laughs> a little bit about DNA and morphology. Animals and people, obviously, are born with genetic potential to do certain things. Here we have the fastest mammal on this planet, namely the cheetah. But the cheetah is a very specialized creature. Cats, felids, have a cardiopulmonary system that enable them. They evolve basically as ambush hunters. And they are able to run tremendous speeds, but for only three or 400 yards at the most. So these guys will go 60, 65 miles an hour, and they are pooped and debilitated after. 300 yards. Dogs evolved from wolves. Wolves basically are cursorial predators. They run down their prey. They have a cardiopulmonary system that enables them. Their genetic potential predisposes them to run tremendous distances. And what we have done with our Diderod and Yukon Quest dogs is literally take this basic foundation 
and improve it. I wonder if we should shut the lights a little bit. I can bit. do that. No? Sure right, right. Just stay on down a bit here. You'll need to go down. Ah, better? I always have to defend my own species, and when we talk about these great athletic abilities of creatures, it's wise to keep in mind what Sir Julian Huxley, the grandchild of um, Thomas Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, said about man. There's no other animal alive that can do what a well-conditioned man can do. A well-conditioned man can run 20 miles, come to a river, swim across it, and then climb a tree on the other side. There's not an animal alive that can begin to do that. And I think it's wise to keep that in perspective. These dogs. The first impression you get about these dogs are that they're small. They're not these big, hairy, fluffy things that people imagine sled dogs to be. First of all, there's a physics involved. If you look at the elite line of human marathon runners, all of the men are about five foot ten, and they weigh about 130 pounds. No matter what kind of athlete you are, if you're a six foot two, 200 pounder, no matter how hard you train, no matter what you do, you will never become a elite marathon runner. The physics don't allow that. You're just too big and too heavy. So these dogs are basically 45 to 50 pound dogs. Put in perspective, an average Cocker Spaniel that's not too fat weighs 25 pounds. These are not big dogs. Traditionally, native dogs, Inuit and Athabascan dogs, were big, heavy, freighting kind of animals. These dogs would go out with the native people. The native people would kill a caribou three miles from the village, and they would bring it down, or they would be hiking when they were nomadic slowly with these dogs. We have taken these dogs and have changed them physically, and especially in the last 75 years or so. <laughs> Admittingly, this guy is not too tall, but some of these native dogs, these Inuit dogs, Athabas, were huge animals, huge, hairy beasts, able to live through great northern winters without almost any support. Here's some dogs from the Shackleton expedition. And what we have done is, we have bred dogs for racing, and we have trimmed them down, and in 75 or 100 years of selective breeding, we have bred these incredible endurance athletes. As I said, these dogs are relatively small. They look different phenotypically, but if you skin them out, they all look the same. These are basically very light bone, thin, short coated dogs that can go forever. They have been selectively bred for endurance, for the will to run, to eat quickly, and to be almost totally non aggressive. <laughs> You know, we are born, and I keep bringing up this point, unfortunately. He was one of my heroes 10 years ago. At that time, Lance Armstrong scored the highest ability to take in oxygen of any human being ever tested. This is something you are born with. They can take a six or eight year old child now, and by doing maximum VO2 uptakes and muscle biopsies, and they can tell you, he ain't going to be a track star, better try golf, or something like that. <laughs> um, so much of our physical abilities are, on, are in our genes. Not only in our genes, but when our genes get turned on and when they get turned off. And then there's the overlay of epigenetics, which I will not touch. 
a little bit about where these races go. Both the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest are races that go for 1,000 to 1,200 miles. Some of you have heard the embarrassment about this year's Iditarod. There just wasn't enough snow. They had to move the Iditarod start from near Anchorage to Fairbanks. It may interest some of you to know that I've checked the weather, the, the temperatures, the last five or six days. We have been colder than any checkpoint on the Iditarod, including the Inuit villages on the Bering Sea. It's pretty damn amazing, <laughs> the weather that we are going through. Basically, the Iditarod starts in a, near Anchorage, traditionally, and, oh, this damn thing, and, and goes roughly 1,100 miles or so. Realize that in Alaska, there are no roads north or west of here. This is all roadless territory. Everything that's brought in here for the race is brought in by light aircraft, by a group called from the volunteers, the Iditarod Air Force. <laughs> what we try to do on these races is get native villages involved. So one year, we take a northern route to, to get some of these northern villages, and another year, we'll take the southern route. I'm often asked, which is the tougher race? They're both tough. And you gotta be, it's a subculture of madness, let's, let's <laughs> say that right away, anybody who wants to do this. The Iditarod is tough because you have roughly 300 and some odd miles to know of the Bering Sea, the coast. The winds can be incredibly fierce here. The weather can be horrible. But often, the Yukon Quest is colder, and you have to go over five major elevation rises. And also, the Yukon Quest has much less support, much less checkpoint. Um, oh. The Yukon Quest runs alternate years from Whitehorse in the Yukon Territories to Fairbanks. This year it ran that way. Every other year it runs that way. The nice thing about the Yukon Quest is, other than two checkpoints, it has road access. So as veterinarians, we have a hell of a time. We just pile into a four-wheel drive vehicle, and we can pretty well follow the race, and there's only two times we have to fly. We have to fly to a little village called Eagle and a place called Scroggy Creek, which is on the Stewart River, which twice now I've tried to find in the summer, and I have been unable to do so. <laughs> Basically, I personally think the Yukon Quest is a little bit of a tougher race than the Iditarod. But as I said, not to demean the Iditarod, it's madness. Um, madness. <laughs> One of the great joys I have in doing the Iditarod, after getting over my intense fear, basically I never quite believed in Bernoulli's principle that described why planes fly. It sounded ridiculous to me then, because the air goes a little faster over the top of the wing than the bottom of the wing. These big things fly. I, I never quite bought that. But nevertheless, they do. One of the great joys is being able to fly over vast areas of territory and at times you can fly two and three hours and not see a sign that a human being has ever existed there. I find that sort of interesting. And realize, I won't get into this either, but that man became, as I mentioned in the course I teach at the, at the Iliad, the OSHA, man truly became human in this environment, in the icy Pleistocene. These dogs, first of all, for most of the race, people are fascinated. 
they wear these boots. And these boots don't just stay on. The typical team that does the Iditarod or the Yukon Quest is going to use about 2,000 boots a race. And for those of you who think, what a glamorous, wonderful thing it is to, to be a musha, just picture 35 below zero and a wind blowing, and you got 16 dogs, that's 64 feet, and every hour and every hour and a half, you're going, you're taking off these boots, you're looking for tears, you're replacing the boots, you're putting salve in on these on 64 feet, you're snacking these dogs. Better tennis or golf. <laughs> children. But I don't think that there are 20 people in North America, quite frankly, that truly make a living, a living in sled dog racing. It's not a big money sport. The winner of the Iditarod, I think this year, he makes $60,000 and gets a Dodge truck. But realize that these people are keeping often 50 to 150 dogs they're feeding. It's a hell of expense. Mm -hmm. When I first did the Iditarod, oh, way back in the early 90s when I was first doing it, the poor guy, he gets his check, I think then it was $30,000, gets his Dodge truck, and his ex-wife's lawyer is there and no <laughs> and collects the truck because of his failure to s spousal support. Oh, but no. one thing I tell you. <laughs> we have bred these dogs to be, as I said, very light and very fast. We don't want big, long, heavy coats on them because they mat up, and I'll show you that later more vividly, with snow and ice and things like that. So very often when it's 40 below, mushers will put jackets and coats on these dogs. The biggest, one of the biggest problems we have with these dogs is keeping weight on them. They are using so much energy that these little 50 pound dogs will consume almost 12,000 calories a day. To put it in perspective, that's 24 Big Macs a day. Uh, and still, they will lose weight. To further put it in perspective, a 150-pound person who's training for an ultra marathon will use six to 7,000 calories a day. These Dogs need incredible amount of calories to keep going. And very often on the Iditarod, when they reach the coast, I don't allow a lot of them to go because they're too thin and they're not going to do very, very well. The first big obstacle you have traditionally when it's not moved to Fairbanks is going over the Alaska Range, which is a little over 4,000 feet of peak. On the Iditarod, you start with the maximum of 16 dogs. You can never change dogs. There's a strategy involved. People drop dogs. They drop dogs if they're hurt. They drop dogs if they're not working, if they're sightseeing. You don't need 16 <laughs> dogs. But to get over these first mountains, it's a nice idea to have a lot of pulling power. The Yukon Quest, you start with 14 dogs. It used to be on the Iditarod in 1990, we allowed 20 dogs, but they were so far out in front of the sled that even with high beam intensive LED lights and stuff like that that mushes use, you couldn't see your lead dog. So we limit it now to, um, to 16. The good mushers, the ones that are not on a camping trip, that are racing to win, they don't just sit on the sled. They work very actively and very, very intensely. In fact, very often you'll hear a, a remark, 
that uh, the guy behind one guy will say, and I never, and I, I never saw a place where he didn't have his footprints. In other words, he's running along the back of the sled. Otherwise, you ride on these little runners. Now picture being pulled for 10 days or nine days, 40 <laughs> below zero, in the back of a sled by these little dogs. It's madness. <laughs> A good part of the race, of both races, run on the Yukon River. I've canoed about 1,500 miles of this river, and it's a, it's a great river. But at this time of the year, it has eight feet of ice, and it's very cold, and a good part of the race, as I said, is run on this river. The coast looks something like this. This is the Bering Sea. Um, What's her name? Sarah, Sarah would be down here, and she'd <laughs> see Russia <laughs> up here. <laughs> and but people live right on the coast here, and they raise dogs. And I think I have some pictures of this later. Right here on the coast, often without any shelter whatsoever. And these dogs do great. It's pretty hard to believe. And there, the temperature is minus 38, which is not atypical. <laughs> when they travel to the race, to the pre-race physical, realize that all of these dogs get far better than we do with human marathon runners. They get an electrocardiogram and they're checked by a trail veterinarian. Um, and they're checked rather thoroughly. They come in these kinds of trucks. They drop the dogs out there. We go over each and every one of them before the race and at the different checkpoints. Here we are examining a team that just dropped his dogs, and we're going over them and checking them. We do drug testing on these dogs. Great job for a grown man. There I have a little copper patch, and we're <laughs> tightening his leg, and ping, and we're getting drug samples, and we randomly drug test these dogs at various checkpoints and things like that. There's a typical Alaskan or Yukon dog box. They're lined with straw, and each dog has his little compartment, and it comes to the race. Charlie, any way. positive drug tests for the dogs? Exceedingly rare, huh. very, very rare. With the humans, it wouldn't be anywhere near as rare. <laughs> One of the, the, shall we say, the interesting and scary things are we fly by airplane, and we land on skis, we <laughs> land on rivers, we land, you don't want to know where. And this is a very typical type of plane you fly in. This is a 1946 model. <laughs> and um, just a brief story. The guy who owns this plane, George Murphy, was 82 years old, and he lives in Willow, Alaska. I'll tell you some stories about these phenomenal people. And he's walking his two golden retrievers, and his wife, Dorothea, who's older than him, is driving the pickup truck <laughs> whilst he's walking his two golden retrievers. And there's a gully, and all of a sudden, she sees a moose charging. And she thinks the moose is charging the golden retrievers. The moose is charging George. Immediately, the moose starts stomping the hell out of George. Eight rib fractures, a stele oh. fracture, and she goes to the back of the pickup truck and picks up a grain shovel that he had and beats the moose <laughs> off this guy. And he was thrown to the hospital. And actually, he did remarkably well. All of the, there are like 25 different checkpoints on the Iditarod. There's 12 on the Yukon <coughs> Quest. And roughly the 200,000 pounds of gear or realize they have to bring food to each checkpoint, they have to bring straw, they have to bring various types of gear and stuff like this. And all of this is flowing in 
by 25 pilots on little Cessna type of planes. They start doing that two or three weeks earlier and hopefully with the weather changing as it is, it doesn't warm up and the food rots and then they're all screwed up for at this checkpoint. But there's a lot of problems logistically with this race. But there's just some of the gear piled out at one of the checkpoints and each musher sends out and he has labels and numbers what he wants at this checkpoint. On the Iditarod, you're allowed to change sleds. On the Yukon Quest, you can't change sleds. There are many characters that do this race. This is my good friend, who's a world-renowned cardiologist and also a bush pilot, and he flies me a lot in, um, on these races. And also, he canoes with me a lot. He look, that's not his normal look. I think he <laughs> hasn't slept in probably four days. <laughs> the Yukon Quest and the Iditarod are big celebrations for the locals there. It's their Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And crowds come up, and it may be 30 below zero, and you have crowds lining the start and things like that. They do a false start in Anchorage just to attract the people. So they, they, they go out there and people bid to ride in the sled and it becomes a whole big deal. And then they put them in a truck and they drive to Willow, Alaska, which is maybe 70 miles away where they start the race. Big celebrations. <laughs> Here they are, racing. Now, at each checkpoint, the musha is required to stop with his dogs. And he must have certain equipment. He must have a gun. He must have snowshoes. He must have, depending on how far the next checkpoint is, between two and four pounds of food per dog. And this checker is going through and making sure that he has the required things. Then he will rest here and the veterinarians will go over dogs. Sometimes I, I, they don't have to be checked at every checkpoint. We sleep in various places, the volunteers, the veterinarians, and this is probably the most remote post office in the United States, in Gwentna. It's about 160 miles from the nearest road, and we sleep in that building. And people use this post office. They come in on dog sled. They come in on airplanes. They come in in snow machines. And a guy named Joe Delia um, ran this post office until he died recently for about the better part of 50 years. This is a typical place where we hang out as veterinarians. <coughs> These are our medical boxes and where we can treat dogs and things like that. One of the great joys of doing this race, what happened? Oh. It is the people that you meet. And you meet people that are living in America, at least on the quest, that live a very, very different life than we live. And some of them seem very happy, and some of them seem very miserable. I mean, just like our society. <laughs> There's a group. There's a team coming in. The dogs are divided. You, you, a lot of people have the impression that you have one lead dog. It would be insane to go out on a 1,200 mile or 1,000 mile race with one dog that knows G and Boar and Horn. <laughs> so each team probably has three or four lead dogs, but most of the teams have one dog that they really depend on, that uses its nose. If there's a right out, if they have to cross some water, they generally have one favorite dog that really gets them through the most hazardous part of this very hazardous type of race. Charlie? Yes? How, how does the lead dog know where to go? That's a very good question. How does the lead dog know where to go? 
on most of these races, what happens is a snow machine goes through for the first team. The races are marked with these, what are they called, sticks that have a little red Close. patch on them. And the first team goes after the snow machine. But within 10 minutes, I mean, you could have a whiteout that blocks, yeah. but these dogs use their nose yeah. and they follow it. That's not to say that occasionally a team gets lost, and that does happen. We now have on the Iditarod, each, each uh, musha has a locator and we can tell where he is. What's amazing to me is in the 30 some odd, 40 some odd years that these races have been raced, no one, no one has died. No one has died in recent years in plane accidents and no one has died in, no musher has died in the race. Early on, we lost a fair, not a fair amount, but we lost a few dogs on the race. On some races where there are 1,600 dogs for a while, we were losing two or three dogs die to race. But since studies have shown why these dogs were dying is very interesting. Most of these dogs were dying of gastric ulcers. And the reason we think that they got these gastric ulcers, they're running so hard that the blood is diverted to the heart, the brain, and the skeletal muscle. And the whole splanchnic bed, the liver, the intestinal tract, may get ischemic, may get a lack of blood. And this may predispose them to ulcers. And a very, very bright guy at the University of Oklahoma friend of mine, named uh, my brain, yeah. Mark Davis, um, he found out that if we give these dogs what half of you are probably taking, Pepsid or something like that, an anti-ulcer medication before and during the race, we have cut down the death rate to almost zero in these dogs. A few of these dogs, even though we do EKGs on them, do die of certain cardiomyopathies that would be impossible to detect short of doing echocardiograms on them. A good deal of this race is run at night. And the reason a good deal of the race is run at night is these dogs are most comfortable when it's way below, say, 10 degrees. Anything over that, they tend to overheat. And so when a lot, of, especially in recent times, a lot of this race is run mainly at night. Picture being alone in the Alaskan wilderness, you've got yourself a headlamp, you've got your 12 or 14 dogs, and you're running on this dark trail. It's, it's madness. <laughs> yes? There's an ideal weight size for dogs. What about the mushrooms? Well, one of the reasons I think women, although not so much recently, have done so well, is they tend to be lighter. Than, you don't want a 300-pound musha on the back of a sled. Yeah. No, most of these, um, certainly the competitive mushas, are very trim, very live looking. You know, they're athletes. Yeah, they're athletes. It's, 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 you know, there are 77 teams, I think, signed up to, um, to um, run the Iditarod this year. Probably 20 of them are somewhat competitive. The other 50 or so are going on a camping trip. <laughs> Here's a little town of 51 people called Takatna that the race goes through. And we love to be stationed at this town. They have great food and great pie, and they treat us very well. Here's a checker going through the sled again. These guys love their dogs. I mean, there's no question about it that there's a, an amazing bond between these people and their dogs. And they talk to them a lot, and they, the, the good mushers really know their dogs, and they, they truly love these beasts. But realize, these dogs, in general, would not make a great suburban pet. 
these dogs have been so selectively bred to run that that's what they want to do. They don't want to sit, stay, come, play dead. They, they, uh, they much prefer to run. Here's a typical scene that you'll see at one of the early checkpoints. All of the teams are spread out. The veterinarians are going over them. There's a few planes that have brought in stuff or have taken out stuff. And this is on a river. This is a frozen river. And that's where the teams are. When the team gets into a checkpoint, the dogs get bedded down, almost always on straw. And they sleep. And they sleep a real sleep. I mean, these, these mushes are exhausted. If they get one or two hours of sleep a night, it's a lot. And they hallucinate. And they are so loopy, I mean, the story. <laughs> you wouldn't believe, I mean, it, it, it is true. It is an exhausting nine or ten days. Here's some typical things that mushes carry. It's a pretty messy musher. But they all have a, a heater that they can cook with, a cooker. And they use alcohol. And these dogs are fed at least two hot meals a day. To get enough calories into them, they are snack every hour, every hour and a half. They eat up to 65% fat. If you were to feed your Shih Tzu that, it would have pancreatitis in a matter of hours. <laughs> and help support some veterinarians. They all have axes and stuff like that. And what they feed these dogs, depending upon what they have a lot of, some of them will give them butter. Just quarter pound sticks of butter, great fat sauce. Others will give them beaver, others certain fish eggs, things like that. Um, the more calories they can get into them, the better. Women, as I said, have done very well in sled dog racing, and um, not recently. They've slumped off a little bit. Allie Zirkel. Uh, Allie Zirkel. Oh, Allie Zirkel has done great. That's right. I forgot Allie. Yeah, she's come into the Yukon Quest. Um, Second, I think, yeah. two or three Second years. Most. Yeah. Close. Here's a guy putting the ointment that I talked about on their feet. There's veterinarians going over a team. We really check these dogs quite carefully. How many veterinarians? Oh, how many veterinarians? It's interesting. On the Yukon Quest, we have a team of about nine. On the Iditarod, we have like 50. That's why I don't do the Iditarod anymore. I, I did last year, I was way up in northern Norway doing a sled dog race. It was just madness. There was like 2,700 dogs. Was, don't even ask. I said, like. But here's, here's a guy mixing up the food. Different mushers. It's sort of interesting. This guy is Martin Boozer, who won this race, I think, three or four times. And he is really loved by the village kids. He's a really, really very, very nice man and very competitive. But what's fascinating is I was giving a lecture at the International Veterinary Medical Sled Dog Association, and this guy comes up to me. And you, you know the feeling. You, you, know, you know him, but where the hell do you know this guy from? And I look at this guy, and finally it occurs to me it's Martin Boozer. But I remember Martin Boozer because I've always seen him in, in huge part as being like six foot three, 200. Hey, a little guy about five foot seven, five foot eight. I couldn't believe it. But um, I finally put it together. This, this is, they sleep wherever they can. This is Joe Reddington, who's the father of the Iditarod. He probably more than anyone else is responsible for putting the, um, the Iditarod together. And just to show you how these people, these Alaskans and Yukoners, they're of a different dimension. When he was 71 years old, he died a couple of years ago of esophageal cancer, but when he was 71 years old, he was coming out of a little Indian town called Nikolai. And in coming out of this town, he got knocked off the sled. Now, these dogs, contrary to your friend David, 
When you're knocked off the sled, they don't stop and see how you are. They just go. And these dogs run to the next checkpoint, which I believe was 31 miles away. This guy walked, I think it was 30 below zero, the 31 miles to the next checkpoint to pick up his dogs and continue the race. Madness. <laughs> Used to be that the, the celebrity races would get the four poster beds in the village, the best places and stuff like that. And these poor slobs who pay their entry fee, I mean, would sleep wherever they possibly can. But we've straightened that out now that the mushers are required to sleep in a certain place in the, in the same place we have facilities for them. And that's, that's very typical, you just step over them. And here are the dogs resting, and then sometimes it gets very cold. And it's amazing, they live and do well through this. Um, they turn into little ice balls sometimes. That's Joe Reddington again, um, the father of the Iditarod. That's probably one of the most famous mushers of all, Susan Bush Butcher, who won the race four times. Unfortunately, she died also of leukemia a number of years ago. And here is arguably the best musher of all time, Rick Swenson. He, run, he won the Iditarod five times and lost the sixth time by one second, one dog nose to Dick Mackey. He, he used to do. But like any other sport, Tiger Woods, all that, you have your time and then you slack off. And I'll tell you about Lance Mackey and stuff like that a little later. These people, the people you meet, are very interesting. This is a guy, an Inuit from White Mountain, um, and it's minus 10, I made a note of that, and he's in his shirt sleeves, and I'm in about seven layers. And I remember meeting him at one of the early checkpoints, and I say, Tony, why are you doing this? And he looks at me and he says, because, you know, I paid my entry fee and I'm doing it. And I said, oh, that's great. He says, but you know, I got cancer. They told me I had cancer. And I said, oh, it's great that you're doing it with cancer. Then he says, but I don't have cancer. So I said, what are you doing it? He said, because I paid my entry fee. But <laughs> no, no these, these guys are really the characters you meet. This guy, I mean, this is, unfortunately, he died too. This is, <laughs> they didn't die on the race. This is Steve Fawcett, who's a world famous explorer and holds all kinds of records in high altitude balloon stuff. And he wiped out on a, on a Nevada desert a number of years ago. And he paid $125,000 to rent a team from Joe Reddington to run the Iditarod. It was another thing he wanted to do. And I walked up to him, and I, I didn't know who he was, and I, I said, you don't look like you belong here. And he says, no, I'm a Chicago stockbroker. I said, what the hell? And he, he didn't finish the race. <laughs> this guy is one of the toughest people I know. This is Joe Garney, who's, a, who's an Inuit from Tella. Alaska, way the hell up north of Nome. And when I, I, when I first met Joe, he comes into a little town called Tecatna, and he says, Doc, I hit a tree. I said, oh, that's too bad. And he says, and I hurt my arm. And I said, can I see it? There are no MDs on, on, on these races. I think they're afraid of getting sued. I put in more stitches in humans than I have in dogs on sled dog races. This is the truth. And, he's, and I say, can I see your arm? And I look at his arm, and I go like, ah, and terrible fractures of probably the distal radius and the ulna. And I said, Joe, you've got a bad fracture. We can get you back to McGrath and fly you and the team out. And all. I said, no, I paid my entry fee. I'm going to finish the race. So what happened was, this is a town of 51 people, and they have a little medical facility, and I found a SAM splint, and I rigged up a splint, 
so that he can get his three layers of gloves over it. And I told him that three checkpoints up, there's a place on the Yukon River called Galena. And in Galena, most people don't realize, we, kept, we had an Air Force base in this little village where we kept our F-15 jets. And this was the first line of attack when Moscow launched its missiles against us, we would fire from Galena the first, <coughs> uh, first rally of things. And I said, they have an x-ray machine there. I want you to get x-rays and stuff like that. I see him a couple of checkpoints beyond that. And there he is. Um, I said, did you get an x-ray? He's wearing the same, no, no, no. And he finished the race. Another story about Joe Garney I, I should tell is, I come up to him one day and I see him sitting on a bale of straw, and he's wearing a parka, and I see him sitting there hunched over, and Joe, you know, in 30 below, I mean. And I go up to Joe and I say, Joe, what's the matter? I don't know, Doc, I don't feel too well. I said, well, let's go up to the cabin, let's get a cup of tea and talk about it. He says, no, I gotta feed my dogs. Goes to feed his dogs, I come back about an hour later, and I say to him, Joe, um, how you doing? He says, I don't know, Doc. I, I'm dizzy and I'm feeling seeing double. He said, that's not good, Joe. I said, <laughs> I said, let's go up to the cabin. And just then, Billy Mayer, the cardiologist I showed you, flies in with his plane. And I tell him what's happening to Joe, and it's getting dark. And he says, Berger, I got to get back. I, have, I can't fly at night, and he hands me some blood samples, and he says, get some blood and some urine from him, and I'll get a stat back at the hospital in Anchorage. So I'm walking with him, and I get the bloods, and I get the urine, and I give it to Billy, and Billy calls me, at that time we used radio telephones, and he phones me, and he says, Berger, I wish I was so healthy, this guy's got nothing wrong with him, and I walk up to him, and I say, Joe, what do you think is wrong with you? And he says, I got the diabetes. And I said, how do you know? And he said, well, four days ago, just before the race, I was di they told me I had the, the diabetes. I said, who told you? He said, my chiropractor showed me so. But he was fine the next morning and continued on the race. These people are tough. This is the guy who, who runs the race to raise money for young kids in some of the Arctic villages mm -hmm. that have real drug and alcohol David problems. David recognizes him. Matt Williams. Yeah. Mike yeah. Williams? Matt yeah. Williams. Great guy. Yeah, his son is now racing from what I gather. Yeah. And, you know, alcoholism, most of the villages are dry. Legally, they're not supposed to have any alcohol. But there's a whole bootlegging thing where people fly in airplanes, and I don't know, I don't know what um, what they're selling a fifth for now, but a fortune, three hundred dollars. So they come in, they pod, that they land, you know, thirty miles from the village. These kids go on their stone machines, a hundred miles an hour. Don't ask. It's it's the suicide rate among these kids is two or three times what it is the rest of the population. Wow. This guy is Sepp Herman. Interesting guy. I met him in 1990. He's a German guy, and his dogs look great. And he's way at the end of the pack, diddling around. And I say, Seth, you could go much faster. Your dogs are in great shape. He looks at me and says, I don't want to go faster. <laughs> I said, you're in a race. <laughs> and he says, what I do is, I take pictures, and then I go back to Germany, and I fill up huge auditoriums, and I make a fortune selling of my experiences on the Iberia. This guy is Charlie Bolding. Charlie Bolding was an amazing character. When Kennedy started his special forces um, group, he was one of the first guys, and God knows how many kills he had. You hear about the American sniper. I don't think he had anything on Charlie Bolding. Charlie Bolding was so screwed up after the wars that he was in that as he describes it, 
he lived under a top for the better part of two years and had a moose leg and a sterno stove. And what he would do is cut off pieces of meat from the moose and cook it on the stunning. When I met him, he was just had fallen in love and was marrying a very wealthy Georgia girl. And his biggest problem was how in the hell he was going to get the people from Georgia, the wedding party, up 43 miles of the Tanana River to his home sled. <laughs> he then gave up sled dog racing, and the last I heard, he built a, 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 a um, cement boat, and God knows where he is. <laughs> we carry the dogs on planes when they're dropped, if they're hurt, if they're sick, if they're really hurt, we red tag them and try and get a plane in as quickly as we can. We put as many as 15 dogs in each of these little planes. And I had the opportunity once to fly with one of the pilots with 15 dogs. And I said, naively, what do you do if they get into a fight? And the pilot went, meh! <laughs> <laughs> I almost died. <laughs> <laughs> At two of the places, we're able to get a 747 in, in Unilacleet and McGrath. And sometimes we can get some of the heavy equipment and the teams that have dropped out that way. There's a guy who's taking care of the, um, dr some of the drop dogs and feeding them. <laughs> you have all, I am responsible for banning poodles the race. What happened was these dogs are amazing. They made 800 miles into the race. <clears throat> and what happened was they came into a, the next checkpoint and they were literally pupsicles. I mean, <laughs> what happened is with this coat, when they lie down in wet snow, they just, and they freeze. And I took three of these dogs had temperatures below 95. Dog, dog temperatures 100 to 102. And it was amazing that we were able to save them all. Um, but after this race, we demanded the dogs have an, in quotes, Arctic type of coat. Yes, Karen? Well, they have hair instead of fur, isn't that correct? Basically, yeah. And but it's just the nature of their coat yeah. that just absorbs um, it just absorbs water, and um, you know you got your body heat, you got your whole stuff, and they get wet, and they freeze. This is Norman Vaughan. Norman Vaughan was a world-renowned explorer who went on the bird on the bird expedition. And the great story about Norman, he's 85 here, and I had to disqualify him because he was unable to take care of his dogs. But the great story about this is. Billy Mayer, the cardiologist, they did a program, National Geographic. Admiral Byrd named a mountain, at Vaughan Mountain, at Mount Vaughan, after Norm. And Norm was 99 years old, and the plan was National Geographic was going to push him up this mountain. <laughs> and on top of the mountain, he was going to, to, to um, Don Perignon. Yeah, with Don Perignon, <laughs> he was going to salute him. But in the contract, he, on his 100th birthday, he said that his cardiologist must go with him. And oh, Billy no. said, God forbid he should live that long, I'll get banned from the cardiology union, allowing a 100-year-old guy to go up in Antarctica. <laughs> 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 We have in a, cu a couple of the real isolated places, like Finger Lake. The Dodge Motor Company gave us these little Quonset hut in case we had some really sick dogs that really needed treatment. <clears throat> One day, three great Alaskan mushers, they go in there and they light a propane stove oh, no. and they get carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> Fortunately, there was a welding cabin nearby, a, a cabin owned by a guy who did welding, and we got oxygen, and we saved them. And they went on to finish the race. <laughs> Moose are a major problem on the race, and this is the reason why they're required 
to carry guns. Moose have killed dogs on the Iditarod. I was on one race where, in a, in a, at a distance of about 75 miles, Moose have charged three different dog sleds and literally demolished the sled, didn't kill the dogs, didn't kill the musha. Moose can be incredibly <clears throat> aggressive creatures. And there's a lot of Alaskans who worry more, and Yukoners, about moose than they do about grizzlies. Personally, I get colitis thinking about grizzlies the first three <laughs> nights I'm sleeping in the Arctic. But that's the side of point. <laughs> this is a typical community center in a little village called Nalato. I have a special attachment to this little village called Nalato. Nalato, for a while, had the reputation of being the toughest village in Alaska. The last veterinarian that was there had a knife put to his throat, and the woman vet that they sent in the year before had to call a May Day because she was afraid literally of being raped by three or four people. So naturally, the next year, they decided to send me. So I, I'm flying with Billy, and you land on the Yukon River, which there is about three quarters of a mile wide, and as we're landing, Billy takes out his 357, and he says, Berger, take this. I don't want a gun. He says, yeah, you do. Take it. So I say no, and he drops me off. It's getting dark, and I'm standing there with my medical kit and my gear, and the village is maybe a half a mile away or so, and I see this snow machine pulling a sled coming to get me. And as this guy gets closer and closer, he gets very close, and I look at him, and he made, those of you who know Jack Plants, look very friendly. <laughs> and I'm about to step into the sled, and he says, it'll cost you a hundred bucks. And I look at this guy, and I say, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a check for a thousand. And he sort of laughs and takes me back to the village, and we have some, tra some trail food. And I cook up a dinner for the eldest spaghetti and God knows what else I can catch up and God knows what else I put in it. But they loved the dinner and every year after that they wanted me back in the lotto and I had some great times there. Very checkpoint. The kids really get into the race. I mean it's their basketball, Super Bowl, football stars. And the kids are cute as hell. I mean in their outfits and in their furs. <laughs> schools. When Alaska, when Prudhoe Bay opened up, there became a rule that every Alaskan village had to have a modern school. And they built this school, this Takatna, for a village of 51 that had six kids. And I swear to you, this school had more computers than Berkeley High. I mean, I couldn't believe it. This was back in about 2000 or so. And they were then paying the Bush teachers, who were a couple, of, like $80,000 a year, to go up and teach in the, in the Bush. This is a wonderful old Inuit guy who is 84 years old, and he keeps the dogs. I'll show you next. And we're standing there on a hill waiting for the sled dogs to come in. And he has these big, old-fashioned, native type of dogs. And as these dogs are coming in, I look at him and I say, here comes the dogs. And he looks at them and says, them ain't no dogs. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the little towns, Nikolai, which is a little um, native Athabascan <laughs> village. That's a typical bar you might see along the trail. And then there are some groupies who follow the Iditarod. And either they fly or they go by snow machine. There's a whole business now of guiding people through the Iditarod. And this is one of the five-star hotels that they stay <laughs> in McGrath. Here's a little puppy being raised probably five weeks old, four weeks old on the Bering Sea. And look at these dogs. There's no shelter. This is the Bering Sea. There's Russia. And they live out there and get 100 degree below zero wind chill factors and stuff like that. The race ends in Nome. 
And he has maybe, although he's lost it in the last number of years, the greatest musher of them all. He won four Yukon quests, two in a row, four Iditarods, won both races back to back. Here's a guy who ran his first Iditarod with a feeding tube. Yeah. He had terrible cancer of the salivary glands. He's had major, major surgery many, many times. He, um, he, he ran this year's quest. He didn't do very well, but he finished. But an amazing character who comes from a family that has been into sled dog racing for many, many years. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Charlie, what's your cost ended? Interesting. The entry fee now for the Iditarod is something like $4,000. I don't know exactly what the new entry fee is for the Quest, but I think $2,200 or $2,400, something like that. Yes? Are, are there famous dogs? I mean, mm -hmm. some that stand out? And, uh, there are. Uh, well, traditionally, <clears throat> the, this all started, I should have gone into, with the 1925 diphtheria epidemic that was wiping out the children in Nome. The only way to get to them was to get a, sled, a series of sled dog teams and um, to race up to Nome. And the most famous of them all was a dog named Balto, which has a statue in Central Park. However, Balto didn't do diddly. It was Togo who did most of the work, but, but that, that's beside the point. Yeah, there are, there are some mushes who have used the same sled dogs, like a dog named Granite that Susan Butchie used to win four Iditarods and stuff like that. It. It's sort of a Hall of Fame of, of the sled dogs. So I grew up in North Conway, and we always claimed Chinook who came from Tamworth was the sort of the Babe Ruth of this. And was that just our local uh, fetish about I knew, him? I don't know, if Tamworth, did you know Eve Seeley by chance? Monadna Kennels, Eve's. In Tamsworth and in that area, they had, they, they developed an in quotes breed of in quotes sled dogs called Chinooks, which are these brown dogs that don't, uh, quite frankly, I looked at them and I didn't think they could run around the block, but I don't know <laughs> for sure. And they, they became a locally famous breed of sled dogs. But um, and for a while, every fourth dog was named Chinook. It means southern wind or something like that. Okay. Yes? Uh, our son is a dog sled racer and musher in Alaska. Chase, uh -huh. you've met him. Part of the madness, yes. Yeah. Right. And, uh, is he mad? <laughs> I think that, yeah. In fact, he came in second in the Yukon Quest 300, uh, losing to Ali's Zirkel. That's, Ali, Ali Ali That's well, great. That's yeah. oh. Ali's great, yeah. yeah. And, and they're neighbors. Uh -huh. oh, she's sweet. Anyway, what I wanted to say was uh, so Rita, my wife, and I went up to the Iditarod last uh, year. Uh -huh for the start, the ceremonial start sure. week in uh, Anchorage and the official start in Willow. And it was just a fabulous experience. It, it is. was much more than we expected. It's a whole week of festivities it's, and it's, events. And yeah. I'd really recommend Did you go to the banquet and all that? We did. Yeah, we met Sarah sure. Palin and sure. talked to Jeff sure. <laughs> You know, Jeff dropped out of the Yukon Quest this year. Yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah. 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 interesting. Yeah. And I've heard two different versions. I don't know. Yeah. One was that it was too cold, which didn't sound right for Jeff. Mm -hmm. And the other was that something, he ran out of food or... Sounded a little weird, so I don't know the true story. But I'd really recommend to people here. For oh, it's a, it's a great... Just amazing. Much more than we Look, any time any of you could get up to the north, go. It's one of the great... Tell them about the North American. That's a cool week to do, too. Another great week is there are sprint races, which I've been the bet for for about three or four years, where sprint races, and these guys run... Three races, 22 miles, 22 miles, and 28 miles over two weekends or sort of or something like that. It's called the North American. And these are a little bit different type of dogs. But they're incredibly conditioned dogs. And the big names in that are Ollie Reynolds and Eagle Ellis. 
Um, so there's all different <laughs> kinds of sled dog racing. And um, it's there's a big... There's a native gathering. There's a in Fairbanks during that week. Ice, ice sculptures. It's a great oh, week. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of great things to do in the north. I recommend you all go if you can. Yeah. A great race. week is to see the polar bears in Churchill. <coughs> Boat race, they call them sprint race. Yeah, yeah sprint, sprint race. race. Yeah. I, I've been the vet for the yeah, yeah. North American yeah. sweepstakes. Yeah, right. Yeah. For right. rendezvous. Right, for, for rendezvous. Run. I've been, I've been there. Chase, our son took us to see the running of the reindeer. Oh, the no. Ceremonial start week in April. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> that's, yeah. Alaska yeah. and the Yukon are great places. Any further questions? Yes. Yeah, Charlie, what's yeah, the average what? running life of a dog? From what age? That, that, that's a very, that? very good question. How does exercise affect health? And we're very interested in that in humans, and we're very interested in that in dogs. I have seen dogs complete the Iditarod at 12 years of age, which is sort of unheard of. Um, most of our 12-year-old dogs of that size would be humus. I mean, we're pretty, we're pretty close. Um, most of these dogs, certainly their best years are from like three to eight, but some of them far extend that. And although, you know, it's very interesting, and the study needs to be done. A lot of, there seems to be a large number of cancers in the humans that are involved in sled dog racing. You know, Charlie Boulding, Susan yeah. Butcher, um, Dee Dee Janro. But I have examined hundreds of these dogs, and I don't know if you realize, but tumors are very common in humans, but they're much more common in dogs. And I have seen almost no tumors at all in these dogs, so it's hard to say. Any further questions? Yes. Yeah, how did you find yourself in this world? Because of Dee Dee. How did that happen? It's interesting. What happened was I had raised, I was crazy, and raised Malamutes uh -huh. for many years. And I was a runner and stuff like that. And I saw this ad way back in like 1989 that they needed veterinary, veterinary volunteers. We volunteer in the pilots all about madness. And, um, that they, and I applied, mm -hmm. and I got rejected. And I think I got rejected for a number of reasons. One is, I think they thought I was too old at that time, and two, a very, I won't mention names, conservative, <laughs> very conservative head veterinarian and I think he saw that I had my practice in Berkeley, California. And that may have been... But the there. next year, I'm flying back from a conference, and Dee Dee Janro is on the plane. For some reason, I'm sitting next to her. And we're talking, and I said, I got rejected. She said, why don't you apply again? I'll talk. And um, that's, how I got, that's how I got started in this madness. You know, sometimes when you're up there, you say, I could be in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. How about like when the dogs aren't racing in the off season? I mean, what kind of activity? Are, are they still really into running a lot? Or is it well, like almost everybody who is competitive and anybody who runs these races keep up the activity of the dogs. What they do is they have um, ATVs and they'll often run them alongside those. And some of these people live so far out in the bush that you can just let your, you know, 30 dogs run loose and they have trails all through that. They live generally, they have a house and they are on a chain and um, that's pretty much <clears throat> their life. But these dogs have been very much selectively bred to do that kind of stuff. Winter dance. Oh, if any of you are interested and, and no kids, one of the best books written on the Iditarod, the best story, is by Gary Paulson, oh, sure. the children's book writer called Winter Dance. It's a, it's a compilation of a lot of sled dogs, but he actually ran the Iditarod twice, as far as I remember. And it's a wonderful, humorous, great book called Winter Dance. If you've got any kids especially, and they're interested in this at all, have them read it.
Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, a comment and a question. Uh, one thing I remember when our son Chase would go out to hook up his teams for the day is the passion the dogs oh, have to Oh, screaming, yelling. Take me, pick me. Yeah, yeah. Take me, take, take me. But they don't, they don't get left picked, they're it, 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 depression in them. It, it, it is madness how we have selectively bred the motivation into these dogs. You know, Charlie Darwin, I always have to mention Darwin. <laughs> he said, basically, that evolution took place very slow and gradually. But when humans interfere, and when we do selective breeding, it's very scary what we can produce in a very, very short period of time. I mean, these dogs literally went from big, heavy type of dogs within 75 years or so to these sleek, um, uh, you know, Maseratis <laughs> in a matter of a very, very short period of time. It's pretty amazing. Yes? I was spending some time in Nome at the finish. We, we Did experienced you? That's the great. start. No, we haven't. We, we experienced the start in Anchorage and so forth, but not uh, the finish in Nome. Is that a good thing to do? Yeah. Nome is a very wild, very crazy village, especially at the end of the Iditarod. It's a little bit of madness. We've heard that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wet t-shirt contests everywhere, even if it's 30 below. So but it, it's a mad town. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, there's a lot of activities that happen here at Vins. We have an owl prowl uh, this Friday evening. We have our owl festival coming up this Saturday, and then there's plenty of other activities throughout the season. Um, I'd also like to thank Carol Weingeist of Upper Valley uh, Sierra Club, uh, David Solomon for coming down from Alaska, John Demos, Alaska Lawyer Street, Robert Ford. And especially tonight, Charlie Berger. Uh, <laughs>